All right, go ahead and open your Bibles up to Job chapter 1. We're going to start this journey in Job tonight. <clears throat> so tonight we're just going to go through the first 12 verses of Job. Um, kind of give an introduction uh, to the book and kind of look at a couple themes first 12 chapter kind of speak of the earthly portion of Job, dealing with Job himself, kind of gives a representation and kind of t- talks about his character. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in verses 6 through 12, we're going to see what was happening in heaven uh, this whole time. We talk a little bit about that. Let's go ahead and dive straight into verse 1. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each in his appointed day, and would send and invite their uh, three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the day of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offering according to the number of, of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So the book of Job begins introducing the main character of the book, who is Job. Some say that he may have even been the author of this book. That is very much up for debate. That he may have written his own life experience. The book of Job is understood to be a masterpiece in Hebrew poetry in Western literature as well. <clears throat> we just talk about possibly Job being the author, but the date and place of the book of Job is still uncertain. Judging from the style of Hebrew I was reading about, it says that this may be one of the oldest books in the Old Testament that possibly have been written. Mike Mason said it's fascinating to think that as we open this text, we may be faced with the earliest of all written accounts of human beings' relationship with Yahweh, the one true God. So this may be one of the earliest books ever written about the God we serve and the interaction with God and his creation. The book of Job is not primarily about one man's suffering, talking about Job, because his problem was not financial, His problem was not medical, and his his problem was theological. His relationship with God, understanding who God truly was. Job must deal with the fact, this fact in his life, that God does not always act the way we think he should. I think all of us has been through that in our lives, where we thought God should have acted this way in our life, and he may have acted the entirely opposite way. Or we may have thought that we should have got some kind of promotion or something in our life, and God said, no, this is not the direction I want you to go. I was thinking when I was in the military for those 15 years, I really wanted to make it to 20 and retire, but God said, no, I have other plans for you. And he moved me back down here. For a couple years, I was a little upset about that decision, but it's gotten better over time. But, we, but God doesn't always work the way we think God should work. In this drama, the book of Job is not so much a record of solutions and explanations to this problem. It is more of a revelation of Job's experience and the answers carried within his experience. So the first look at Job shows him to be an exceedingly righteous man. In verse 1, we're going to reread it, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, 
one who feared God and shunned evil. So this was a righteous man. This was a man who feared God and seemingly, in these first uh, five verses, seemingly has it all together. He had a great family, as we're going to talk about. He had all kind of worldly possessions. He made sacrifice for his children, so you know he loved his children. And then we'll see as the book goes on that disaster hits Job. That disaster even hits the righteous people of God from time to time. That we are not immune of the, from those things. It says here that he definitely seemed to have lived before the time of Moses and the people of Israel, perhaps even before Abraham. So if we're trying to place him in the time frame of when he was alive, uh, there's a few things that uh, a few of the scholars kind of looked at. Some believe that he may have been Jobab that was missing, mission, mentioned in Genesis 10, 29, uh, which would put him in the era between Noah and Abraham. If that was the era of Job, then we can say that Job's deep and true relationship with God was no doubt passed down to him through his ancestors since the time of Noah. So we know that they said Noah was a righteous man, that he was a good man, and he was the only one on earth that was that way, and God ended up saving him. So the knowledge of God could have been passed down from Noah down to his children and ultimately down to Job, if he was in that era of time. In this respect, he was, a, he was somewhat like a Melchizedek that we see in Genesis 14. He just simply appears on the scene. He didn't have any super lineage. He didn't have, it doesn't say who Job's mother or father is. We don't know what lineage he was in, but he just pops up as a worshiper of the true and living God, someone who followed God and was a, was a righteous man. Others have pointed out several reasons that, uh, for dating Job later, perhaps even around the generations of Jacob and uh, Esau. So we see here that he's from the land of Uz. Uh, Huz, H-U-Z, was Abraham's nephew, and possibly this city was named after him. The son of his brother in the land of Uz may have been named after him. Eliaphaz, we'll talk about him in, in Job chapter 2, that's one of the buddies there, uh, was the son of Esau. The son of Esau had a son named Timon, and the descendants of Timon were known for their wisdom. And Bildad uh, is called a Shuhite. We'll talk about him as well in Job chapter 2. And Shua, and Shua, was a son of Abraham for, uh, through Keturah. So Job possibly could have been around the time of Abraham as well. Scholars really don't know when he was placed here on the earth, but those are a few suggestions that I found. Uh, this strong statement of the godliness of Job is important to understand for the rest of the story. Job was a very godly man. And matter of fact, we'll read when we go through verses 6 through 12, we'll see God actually bragging about Job, how righteous he was. So not only does the author put him as a righteous and blameless man here in verse 1, but we're going to see God himself bragging on Job. Lawson said, Job was blameless. This does not mean that Job was sinless, but blameless. There is a huge difference. Sin is vertical and blameless is horizontal. As Job lived before the watchful eye of his peers, no one could justly charge Job with moral failure. His reputation was impeccable. Our reputation should be impeccable as well amongst our peers, amongst our family members. They should not be able to speak evil of us in any way. Though we sin and though we fall short of the glory of God, our lifestyle and the way we present ourselves and walk should be upright. We should not be dabbling in things that we know will bring a bad name to us or our families. And I, and I believe Job did that. He walked upright with the Lord. Said that Job had seven sons and three daughter, daughters. In this culture, that was a status symbol, to have a big family like that. That means you were well off and that you were somebody in that community says that Job had 7,000 sheep amongst other livestock that we just read about. How many camels did he have? 3,000 camels. That's a lot of camels. But he had a lot of livestock, and so that also made him an affluent man. So he probably 
sold and trade this livestock for a living. His godliness and wealth and status made it true that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. So it says that he was the greatest in the East where he lived at. It also said that his sons would go and feast in their houses on appointed days. So here we see that the idea is that the description seems to be that Job's family was happily, happy in close relationship. It says that his sons would have feasts and invite the sisters over to come and eat and drink as well. And I'm pretty sure their families also would come together. It would kind of be like us getting together for the holidays or maybe celebrating a birthday. I don't believe that they were given over to pleasure seeking or festivities for the sake of it, but I believe they did it just to have fun as a family and to be, become together. Spurgeon said, and he's talking of Job, if he had condemned it, he would never have offered sacrifice to God. Lest they should have sinned, but he would have told them at once it was a sinful thing and that he could give no countenance to it. So Job didn't see what his children was doing as wrong. He thought it was a good thing. Matter of fact, Spurgeon saw Job 1, 4 through 5 as a permission for feasting and celebration amongst believers. I know there's some denominations and some cults that believe celebrating birthdays is bad, that we should never celebrate birthdays or celebrate any kind of festivities, that that is wrong in the sight of God. But I believe God enjoys the, his children celebrating things that are good, things that are of him, enjoying and celebrating birthdays, the birth of a child, celebrating the fact that God brought this child into the world. I think that is a wonderful thing that we should celebrate. So here we see Job's children having a feast and celebrating and enjoying it. And here is Spurgeon. He actually, Spurgeon actually had uh, preached a Christmas sermon on this very text, Job 1, 4 through 5, and use it as proof that God allows and enjoys such celebration from his people. So I think that is, that is awesome that he used that as a sermon to show that God enjoys his people celebrating. Then it says here that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offering, offer burnt offerings for each one of his children just for in case they slipped up that day or that night and cursed God and did something against God. The idea seems to be much more that Job was a rigorously godly man than that his children were living in sin. I believe, God, I believe Job loved his children. And waking up every morning to sacrifice, for, sacrifice uh, for them was a way of him showing his love for his children. Job cared about their, his children's spiritual welfare so deeply that he offered individual sacrifices on their behalf, lest they doubt, ignore, or dishonor God. He had to offer a bull as a burnt offering every morning for each individual of his kids. So it says he had seven sons and three daughters. That is a lot of bulls. That is an early morning, he would have to kill it, fillet it, and sacrifice it for each one of his sons and daughters. That's a whole lot of work. And yet we think that it's tough to get up early in the morning to bow our heads and pray a blessing over our own children or our own family. Maybe we should sacrifice that early morning sleep and get up and pray for our families before they start their day. If Job can get out there and sacrifice all these bulls, we can wake up 30 minutes to an hour earlier than we normally wake up to pray for our family. And men, I'm speaking to some of y'all, we need to get up and cover our family with the blessings of God and with the covering of God. We are the leaders in our family. We need to do that for our families. So we see Job doing that for his children, blessing them, sacrificing on their behalf. That way their spiritual welfare was taken care of. Now, one would not know it from the first few verses, but the book of Job is about an epic war. There's no cities attacked. There's no cities that were 
conquered or besieged. There's no battle to be won or lost really in this book. There's no oceans that are sailed with battleships to attack the shores. But this is a battle indeed. And this is a battle that every one of us as human beings go through, battling with who God is, battling with wrong that is done in our lives when we maybe don't deserve the wrong that happens in our lives. This whole conflict takes part on an ash heap, or you could say a garbage dump. The entire book is, takes place on a garbage dump outside the village where Job is living. It is an epic war, but one of the inner life, a struggle to make sense of some of the deepest questions in our life. And hopefully as we go through these chapters of Job, we'll be able to answer some of the questions that we may want to ask, but we often keep inside. Hopefully God answers some of those questions for us. So verses 6, we're going to see the other half of this. So we just seen the earthly half of who Job was, who his family is, how he's rich, how he has all this influence, and how he's a godly and blameless man. He sacrifices uh, for his children early in the morning to ensure that their spiritual welfare is taken care of. Now we're going to look at the spiritual realm of this. So let's start in verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So we see God bragging on Job right here. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now we're going to see a scene that is revealed in heaven that Job or anyone else on the earth, they can't see this conversation going on. The story of Job can really only be properly understood by taking into account what also happened in heaven and by having more than, more than any earthly perspective. So we, we often, all we see in our life is from an earthly perspective. We don't see the, he, the heavenly realm and, and, the, and the war that's going on around us. There is a, a heavenly beings that are at war constantly for the souls of man, constantly at battle. We have our own war going on inside, spiritual war going on inside of us, as well as what's going on in the spiritual realm that we don't see. So this is kind of giving us a glimpse of how some of this works in the spiritual realm. We see here they use the, the word, the phrase, son of God. It, it is used in the Old Testament to describe angelic beings. That's both fallen angelic beings and those who are still on the side of God. Among this group of angelic beings is Satan who comes amongst them. So we see Satan will come in the presence of God. And the fact that Satan came among the rest of the angelic beings just proves to us that he is not equal with God by any stretch of the imagination. He is not equal with God no matter what Hollywood tries to tell you. We often think of him as being the opposite of God, and I'm pretty sure that delights him and gets him excited because his whole point was to what? Rise up and overthrow God. The pride rose up in him that he wanted to be equal or even greater than God as he went after him. So for us to compare him as the opposite of God, I'm pretty sure that brings great delight to his heart, and we don't want to do that. This inflates Satan's status and importance, thinking of him as the opposite of God, as if God were light and Satan was darkness, or God was hot and Satan was cold. Satan could only wish that he was the opposite of God. 
But God wants us to know that Satan is a, simply a created being like the rest of the angelic beings that were created by him. Created beings like the creation he has here on the earth. He is merely a creation of, of God and not an equal. So if Satan has an opposite, it is not God the Father, it's not God the Son, not God the Holy Spirit. It would be closer to someone maybe like Michael the Archangel or Gabriel, someone along those lines, but not God. There is no one equal to God. So the fact that they came to the presence of God himself, they came before the Lord, shows us that angelic beings, indeed fallen angelic beings, do have access to God. You can, you can read about two other incidents like this in 1 Kings 22 uh, and also in Zechariah 3, verse 1. So if you want to write that down, look for it later. God allowed Satan and fallen angelic beings into his presence for one reason, his purpose. Had nothing to do with their purpose or their want or their will. But he allowed them to come into his presence for his purpose and his purpose only. Therefore, he demanded to know where Satan had been. He wanted to know what Satan was doing. And Satan told him, hey, I've been back and forth on the earth. <clears throat> First Peter 5, 8 tells us that we should be sober and be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about, the, uh, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And that's all he does on the earth, sees who's weak, who he can, he can prance on and get them and devour them and destroy their soul. That's what Satan is good for. He's a father of lies, deceiving people. So we see here he's telling God, I've been going back and forth on the earth. He's looking for people and souls to destroy. It could be said that Satan has an active interest in what's happening on earth because he already knows his fate. He already knows that he is a fallen being and, and, and where his destiny lies, so why not take a couple more with him as he's going down? And it's funny because you would think that maybe Satan would say, hey, what about your servant Job? Let me have a go at him. But God offers Job up because ultimately at the end of the book of Job, God gets the glory for it all. And that's what it's all about, us bringing God glory. So we see here that God says, have you considered my servant Job? It was God who brought up Job as a subject for discussion. And God brought up Job in the sense of bragging about Job's godliness and character. You think God brags about Ron maybe every once in a while? About David? That'd be awesome, God brags about us. And we see God bragging about Job here. And God was so impressed with Job that he affirmed the description that was given to him in verse 1, that he was a blameless man and that he feared God and he was righteous and he shunned evil. And we think of Satan and how he considers the saints of God. What does Satan really think about us, believers in Christ? I think he, seems, he sees us and is amazed at the difference between himself and God's people. He sees us and knows that though he has fallen, these earthly creatures that believe in Christ are standing up. He sees us and is amazed at our happiness and our joy because he knows too well the misery of his own soul. He knows where his end is going to be, but he admires and hates us all at the same time. The peace that our souls have as believers, he despises it. He sees us and looks uh, for some fault in us so that he may find some small comfort to his own black soul and hypocrisy. He sees us, especially those who do great works among the saints, and sees those who block and hinder his foul work, because prayer can stop the work of Satan. Worship and praise to God can stop the works of Satan and protect the believer. He sees us and looks for an opportunity to do harm to us, Satan is truly our enemy, seeking to take as many of those unbelieving souls with him into hell, where he's going to end up going. So in verse 8, we read here, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who, fear, who fears God and shuns evil? There is none like him on earth. Job was a blameless and righteous man. 
He was, he was a blameless and upright man, no matter what his friends would later say to him. Because some of these conversations we're going to read about were pretty tripping. They would tell him all kind of stuff. Well, maybe, maybe you're, you're in this situation because maybe you had a big sin or, or maybe you didn't worship him the right way or what have you. But God is telling us right here that it was none of that, that he was blameless and right in the sight of God. We know and God knew that, God, that Job was not sinless perfect, yet God called him blameless. We know that Job was, Job was not sinless perfect, yet God unashamedly seemed to see him that way. And as modern believers, we stand in the same place, completely justified by Jesus Christ. When God sees us, he sees us just like he sees Job, blameless, righteous, shunning evil. So here, Satan is going to fulfill his description that we have of him in Revelation 12, 10, that calls him the accuser of the brethren. Because he says, does Job fear God for nothing? So you're telling me that Job is a righteous man. You're telling me that Job is upright and perfect in your sight. And you're telling me he's doing all this for nothing? Isn't he trying to get some kind of personal gain for this? So here we go, Satan accusing the brethren, just as he is called the accuser of the brethren in Revelations 12. Satan's accused Job before God, insisting that Job's godliness was essentially false and that Job only served God for what he can get out of him. There's a lot of people that come to church just to try and get something out of God or get something out of the people of God. And we have to watch out for that. We've got to be discerning in those areas. But Satan's uh, reply to God first reveals his essential cynicism. He doubts every supposed good of being uh, dishonest and hollow. He would, he would doubt God and why Job was being so good. He would try and get God to even doubt himself and what he was saying. But that's nothing new because when, when Satan was in the garden, he would try and doubt, have Eve doubt God and the goodness of God. So the Satan's schemes and his ways have not changed over the centuries. They're the same as in the Garden of Eden as they are today, trying to deceive and try to get us to believe a lie about God. These accusations against Job was also an accusation against God himself, for it implied that God had bribed Job into obedience. Hey, I'll do this if you be good today. Satan's accusation gave testimony to the fact that God had protected Job. It said that he had a hedge around him. A hedge. I pray that in the morning for my children. I pray you put a hedge of protection around my children every day. And he had also blessed him. It says that he was blessed by God. So Job had the whole package from God. He had a hedge of protection. He had blessings on him. He had a wonderful family. And Jesus indicated that Satan wanted to do much more against Peter than God would allow him to do as well in Luke because he had a similar hedge of protection, if y'all remember that story. So Luke 22, 31, 32 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. I wonder how many times Satan may have asked to sift us like wheat. He may have gone before God asking, that, hey, I want to take Ron out today. Ron's on fire witnessing the people, and people are getting saved by Ron. I can't have that happen. Let me, let me try and test his faith. I wonder how many times he may have done that. And you know, us as a church, as we begin to, to grow as disciples and we begin to spiritually mature, Satan's not going to like that. Because if we're a church that's just dormant and not doing anything, he's not even going to bother with us. But if we're a church that, that wants to reach out to the community and we want to make a difference for the kingdom of God, we're going to start seeing tests. We're going to start seeing trials. We're going to start seeing Satan asking God, can I test Calvary Chapel of Lafayette? So we have to watch out for that because there's always, when you start really doing something for God, there's always that, that chance that, Satan's going to come and try and test us. So, confident in his accusation against Job, Satan insists to God that Job would surely curse him to his face if he let down that hedge of protection. 
if that protection was withdrawn for him. Satan believed that adversity could make Job move from a standing in faith to where Job would sit there and curse God and be deceived by him. And we're going to see throughout the book that he never cursed God. Ephesians 6.13 uh, 6, says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We've got to take up that whole armor of God to be able to stand against what the enemy wants to do to us as believers. In response to Satan's accusation, God gave him great, though limited, permission to attack Job. You can attack anything Job has, just don't lay a hand on Job, he says. So God would let down that hedge uh, just a little bit. He wouldn't completely remove it. And when God allowed it, Satan was more than happy to attack Job up to the limitations that he was given. <clears throat> and as he did, he continued a sequence of events in the spiritual realm that were real, but not immediately apparent to Job. You know, there's things that happen to us in our lives that we may just think is normal. A car wreck, sickness, you know, we could fall into poverty, what have you. I mean, the list can go on. We may see those as just normal things that happen in life. And sometimes they are. Sometimes it's just normal things that happen in life. But I believe sometimes it's a spiritual battle that's going on in our lives. You know, you, get, you come down with a sickness, you never get sick, all of a sudden you're sick. Maybe Satan's trying to sift you out. You know, you're doing really well financially, all of a sudden the bottom drops out. But how is your, what is your reaction going to be when that happens? That's the question you're going to have to ask yourself. How are you going to react whenever these trials and these tribulations come? Are you going to turn to the flesh, or are you going to praise God? And we'll see that Job ends up praising God. The revelation of the heavenly scene behind the earthly scene helps us to understand the later comments of James on Job. In James 5, uh, verse 11, it says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the per uh, perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. There are two great themes in the book of Job that James gives us right here. Number one is the perseverance of Job. As believers, we have to persevere in our faith. Tough times are going to come, but we've got to be the tough people that keeps on going. The tough people that keeps on praising God even in our storm. We have to give God praise and glory in the good times and the bad and persevere through it all. And also the end that was intended by the Lord. We don't understand all the things that God does. They say the Lord works in mysterious ways. I believe that. And we don't see the end game from his perspective. I think if we can see it from his perspective, we would have a lot better time accepting the decisions that he's made in our lives. But that's where faith comes in. That's where trusting God that ultimately he's going to be working for our good comes into play. So we need to persevere through, just like Job did, through all our hard times and realize that God ultimately has something good in the end. So it is important that we learn both of these themes. The end intended by the Lord in James connects with God's eternal purpose as revealed in Ephesians 3, 10, and 11. It says, To, in, to the intent and now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it says here, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of heavenly places. The church is supposed to glorify God. The church is supposed to show those principalities and powers in heavenly places the glory of God. That is ultimately the end goal. It's not about you is not about me it's about the glory of God and him being glorified through his church Job made known the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers in heavenly places this showed all those who had fallen the fallen angels that God was all powerful and almighty that God could bring someone down to the dirt of the earth and also raise them to the heights of heaven 
Because we'll see at the end of this how blessed Job ends up being. So as good as Job was at the beginning of this book, he was, a, he was to be a better man at the end of it. He was better in character and more humble and more blessed than before. So we'll go through the rest of chapter 1 next week. But just realize this book is about our journey as well. We're going we're gonna to go through our hard times. Our, we're going to go through our hills and our valleys in our life. But we have to always praise and keep our faith in God through it all. Amen? All right. Father, we thank you for this word tonight. We thank you that we can look at Job and see how he persevered through his hard times, Lord. We can also see the end in sight that we are to give glory to you and to magnify your glory to all who are there, Father God. We ask that you have blessings over those who are here tonight and keep us with safe travels home. In Jesus' name, amen.